the U.S. justice system is designed to find an defendant guilty or not guilty of the crime they're being charged with. But the system is run by humans, and humans are imperfect. Here are three murder cases where the defendant may or may not have been correctly convicted. Number one, Amanda Lewis. Around 3 p.m. on August 8, 2007, a 911 dispatcher in Esto, Florida, received a frantic phone call from 27-year-old Amanda Lewis. Her seven-year-old daughter, Adriana Hutto, had fallen in a family pool and wasn't breathing. Adriana was airlifted to a nearby hospital, but sadly was pronounced dead later that evening. At first, investigators believed Adriana's death was accidental. There were no signs of foul play, and Florida frequently leads the nation in number of drownings for children 15 and younger. But hours after Adriana's death, the Holmes County Sheriff got a call from Amanda Lewis's mother, Brenda Burns. Burns, along with her husband, had been watching Lewis's six-year-old son, AJ, in the aftermath. Burns insisted the sheriff needed to hear what AJ had just told his grandmother and step-grandfather. AJ was brought into the police station that evening with a shocking story. The tragedy, AJ insisted, was not an accident. Their mother had intentionally drowned Adriana. Once this revelation came out, police began investigating Amanda Lewis. Upon searching her house, they found no toys, even though two young children lived there, which was strange. When confronted about this, Lewis said the toys had been taken away as punishment and locked in a shed, but a search of the shed revealed no toys either. Police also recalled the house smelling of urine. Other things police considered red flags were an ER doctor who said Lewis had no emotion after learning of Adriana's death and Lewis's son who had died unexpectedly at 16 months. The autopsy said the child died of a seizure disorder, but now that Lewis had two dead children, police began to grow suspicious. Larry Bassford, who eventually prosecuted the case, believed Adriana's death was a punishment that went too far. As he pointed out, the pool was 32 to 35 inches deep and Adriana was 47 inches tall. If she accidentally fell in, all she had to do was stand up and she had done this before. One month after Adriana's death, Lewis was arrested and charged with first degree murder. Her trial began on February 19, 2008. Among evidence of Amanda's guilt presented at the trial was her alleged lack of emotion when hearing of Adriana's death, as well as the difficulty she had bonding with her daughter in early years. Former co-workers of Lewis recalled an incident where Lewis came to work irate because Adriana had written all over her car with permanent marker. In her anger, she exclaimed, I want to kill her. And there was physical evidence too. Adriana's autopsy report showed bruises on her face, consistent with the way AJ told police his mother had held her head underwater. But others weren't convinced of Lewis's guilt. An expert in children's testimony said AJ was unreliable. His story changed multiple times, even during the initial investigation, and there were inconsistencies police initially ignored. Lewis's lawyer said her reaction, or lack thereof, to Adriana's death was a reflection of her personality and pointed out that she was hysterical during the 911 call. Indeed, you don't have to be an expert in body language to know everyone reacts to and processes grief in very different ways. Lewis's family believes her step-grandfather, Charles Burns, who wasn't fond of Lewis or her parenting, coached AJ into telling his story. The fire chief believes Adriana slipped in the pool and accidentally hit her head. After a four-day trial, jurors took two hours to render a guilty verdict. A month later, Lewis was sentenced to life in prison. AJ has since been adopted. He'll turn 18 at some point in 2019, at which point he'll get to decide for himself whether he wants a relationship with his biological mother. Number two, the murder of Martha Moxley. On the night before Halloween, many children and teenagers observe what's known as Mischief Night. The celebration includes activities such as switching shop signs and leaving rotten vegetables on people's doorsteps. While Mischief Night activities can be dangerous, they're often harmless. But for the town of Greenwich, Connecticut, Mischief Night in 1975 would not only turn deadly, but thrust their tiny town 
into the national spotlight. On the night of October 30, 1975, 15-year-old Martha Moxley left her Greenwich home to celebrate Mischief Night and never came back alive. Her body was found the next day under a pine tree on her property. She had been beaten to death with a golf club so hard it broke in half, then stabbed with the sharp end of the club shaft. Her skull had been beaten in so badly, investigators couldn't tell what color her hair was. Everything was red from her blood. Unfortunately for Martha and her loved ones, the investigation had many problems from the start. Police in Greenwich, which was generally thought of as a safe community, hadn't seen a murder in decades and were ill-equipped to deal with one. The crime scene wasn't secured and many people walked over it, causing contamination. The Connecticut State Medical Examiner was called in to perform the autopsy, but couldn't perform it until a day after the murder. This delay affected results. The medical examiner couldn't narrow the time of death down very much. But these criticisms didn't get nearly as much attention as the number one controversy in this case. Within days, Martha's 17-year-old neighbor, Thomas Skakel, had become a prime suspect. His house was the last place Martha had been seen alive. The golf club used to kill her matched a set found in the Skakel home, and they were the only family in the neighborhood who owned one like it. Thomas's story constantly changed and he was caught in several lies by police. He also had motive. Martha wrote in her diary that Thomas had a crush on her. According to witnesses hanging out with the teenagers the night Martha was murdered, Thomas made numerous advances at Martha, all of which were rejected. But there was one problem. Thomas's father, Rushton Skakel, was the brother of Ethel Kennedy, the widow of Robert F. Kennedy. The Skakels had status. The police were reluctant to believe a member of the wealthy and powerful Kennedy clan could commit such a heinous crime and began looking elsewhere. They searched one suspect's home thoroughly but let him go after he passed a polygraph. But they never searched the Skakel home themselves, instead allowing an 18-year-old relative of the Skakels to do it. The case went cold for almost 15 years. Then, in 1991, another Kennedy, William Kennedy Smith, was accused of rape. At some point, a rumor began that Smith was visiting the Skakel home the night Martha was killed. This rumor was eventually proven false, but the attention it brought to Martha's case thrust it back into the spotlight, and the case was reopened. This time around, Thomas Skakel's story changed. Instead of saying he had been working on a report that night, which was later proven false by his teacher, he claimed he and Martha had sex, but the autopsy report showed no sign of sexual activity, even saying Martha was a virgin when she died. But Thomas wasn't the only one police were looking at. His brother Michael, who was 15 at the time of the murder, had always provided the alibi that he was in bed. But now it changed. Now he told police that instead, he had gone to Martha's house later that night. But state prosecutor Daniel Brown still didn't feel there was enough evidence to charge Michael with murder. In 1998, author Tim Dumas's book, Greentown, was released. In the book, Dumas was critical of Brown's decision, saying he was being too cautious. A few days after the book's release, Brown resigned. In 1999, the book, Murder in Greenwich, Who Killed Martha Moxley, was released. The author, former LAPD detective Mark Furman, theorized that Michael Skakel had actually been the killer. According to his theory, both Skakel brothers had feelings for Martha and Michael flew into a jealous rage after seeing his crush with his brother. So after Martha left his house, he followed her and attacked her with the golf club. On January 19, 2000, an arrest warrant was issued, likely for Michael Skakel, though he wasn't publicly named. He turned himself in later that day. At a pretrial hearing, two of Skakel's former classmates claimed he confessed to them that he would get away with murder because he was a Kennedy. But the prosecution didn't have as solid of a case as they might have liked. Police had looked at numerous suspects over the years before even considering Michael 15 years later. He wasn't arrested until two books criticized the investigation, one only providing a theory as to how he might have killed Martha. And there was very little physical evidence. Despite this, Skakel was found guilty on June 7, 2002, and later that summer was sentenced to 20 years to life. Many appeals and petitions for a new trial followed, but all were denied, as was parole in 2012. 
But then on October 23rd, 2013, a new trial was finally granted. On November 23rd, Skakel was released after his bail was posted. Then, on May 4th, 2008, the Connecticut Supreme Court vacated Skakel's conviction. On January 7th, 2019, it was announced this decision would be upheld. Although the state could still retry Skakel, he was not considered legally responsible for Martha's murder. Sadly, more than 30 years after Martha's death, her loved ones have many questions and few answers. Was Thomas Skakel responsible? Did someone from outside her neighborhood or town kill her? Did Thomas commit the crime with assistance from Michael? Or was the right person convicted all along? And if so, was he released because of a lack of evidence or because of his family's power and status? Number three, the West Memphis Three. On May 5th, 1993, Three eight-year-old boys went missing in the tiny town of West Memphis, Arkansas. The next day, their bodies were found in a creek in a wooded area known as Robin Hood Hills. The bodies of Steve Branch, Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore had numerous injuries, and their hands had been hogtied to their ankles with their own shoelaces. Naturally, the community was shocked, and there was enormous pressure on police to make an arrest. A few days after the murders, police reached out to juvenile probation officer Jerry Driver for a list of names of people he thought might be involved. Among the names on Driver's list were 18-year-old Damian Eccles, 16-year-old Jason Baldwin, and 17-year-old Jesse Skelly Jr. Police interviewed Damian and Jason several times, but ultimately it was Jesse who broke the case wide open. On June 4th, they paid a visit to Jesse and informed he and his father of the $35,000 reward in exchange for information leading to an arrest. Later that day, Jesse went to the police station with a confession. He didn't admit to killing the boys, but said he was there and watched as Damian and Jason committed the crime, which also included sexual assault. All three boys were soon arrested. On February 4, 1994, Jesse was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison plus 40 years. Damien and Jason were tried together and, on March 18, were also found guilty. Jason was sentenced to life in prison while Damien received the death penalty. For most cases, this would be the end of the story, but for Damien, Jason, and Jesse, who would come to be known as the West Memphis Three, their story was just beginning. During the investigation and following trials, HBO producers were on the scene documenting a great deal of the goings on. On June 22, 1996, Paradise Lost, The Child Murders at Robin Hood Hills aired on the network. But even before the documentary, which clearly favored the innocence of the three, the case was gaining national attention. The Free the West Memphis Three movement began in 1995, and the case had originally caught the interest of popular band Metallica, who lent their music to Paradise Lost. Other celebrity supporters included Ozzy Osbourne and Peter Jackson, who produced the 2012 documentary West of Memphis. But perhaps the most well-known supporter is actor Johnny Depp, who maintains a friendship with Damien Eccles. The pair even has matching tattoos. Supporters of the West Memphis Three often point to the botched police investigation, lack of forensic evidence, and unreliable witness testimony. Jesse Muskelly Jr., who originally implicated the three back in 1993, is thought to have an IQ of 72 and has claimed his initial confession was coerced. There were multiple inconsistencies in his story, including his claim that the boys were murdered at noon when they would have been in school. While shown on the stand in Paradise Lost, Chief Inspector Gary Gitchell glosses over these inconsistencies, saying Jesse simply got confused. Also remember the $35,000 reward Jesse had hanging over his head, as well as the fact that he didn't actually admit to committing the murder. At least two witnesses have retracted their statements since. One, a former cellmate of Jason Baldwin, has even come out and apologized to Jason for his role in getting him locked up. Two follow-up films to Paradise Lost examine two family members of the victims as potential suspects. John Mott Byers, the father of Christopher Byers, was considered a suspect at one point by police. And Terry Hobbs, the stepfather of Steve Branch, was allegedly abusive. Both men have criminal histories. Another oft-used defense of the three is a phenomenon known as satanic panic. 
Titanic. From the late 1970s to the early 1990s, the United States saw the rise of occultism and Satanism, as well as a string of murders thought to be associated with these beliefs. After the West Memphis murders, speculation ran rampant that the crime was committed by Satanists performing a ritual sacrifice. While Damien Eccles certainly dabbled in Satanism, if nothing else, supporters say that Satanism is misunderstood and that the three were vilified and locked up with little evidence other than the fact that they were a little weird. Still, a smaller but equally vocal group believes the West Memphis police had the right culprits all along. They often cite Damien's history of violence as well as his frequent lies both on and off the stand, as well as his lack of a credible alibi. They also bring up a reported incident where, while staying in a mental hospital in 1992, Damien claimed he and his girlfriend were planning to have a baby and sacrifice it to Satan. In 2013, one YouTube channel compared the wounds found on one of the boys to a knife found in the water outside a trailer park where Jason Baldwin once lived and found a match. On August 19, 2011, after years of an uphill legal battle, Damien, Jason, and Jesse entered into Alfred pleas. This legal maneuver allows a defendant to maintain their innocence while also admitting that the state has enough evidence to find them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. This new plea reduced their sentences to time served, and although they are still considered legally responsible for the murders, the West Memphis Three were released from prison. So, what really happened that day in West Memphis? Were three teenagers wrongly convicted of a crime because they were seen as freaks? Or did West Memphis police have the right culprits all along? Regardless of what actually happened, whoever murdered these three eight-year-old boys is probably not in jail. So what are your thoughts on these cases? Do you think the defendants we cover here are innocent or guilty? Be sure to like, share, and subscribe if you found this interesting. All the cases listed here are fascinating cases you can take a deep dive into, so I highly recommend doing your own research as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.